<laughs> okay, so I am here today with a very dear and old friend of mine, and we're not old, but we are old friends. <laughs> Let's admit it, Willow. We're ancient, but like in a good, wise kind of way. Well, Audrian, <laughs> like once upon a time, 43-ish was old. Now that we're in no. our 43, 44 zone, it feels really young. <laughs> feels great. It feels, feels great. So 40, 40 is the new 20, for sure. <laughs> so I want to sort of tell um, probably both of our lists sort of how we met and sort of a little bit of our backstory. So Audrey and I met when we were um, in early high school, yeah. maybe even middle school for a minute, but in early high school, Audrey won the role of Anne Frank at our high school. She's laughing, but this was you guys at the time of, of our lives in this time period, this was sort of an astounding feat for everybody. And to play such an iconic role, of, of Anne Frank, who I believe at that time in our lives, we also identified with because we were her age at that time. And, and this idea of living in hiding and or as we are sort of all admittedly living in a version of quarantine, granted not nearly as scary or bad as what she survived. Yeah. But regardless, we all so identified with that. And what I want to speak to you about today is what you specialize in, and that is story. And how Anne Frank's story impacted you, perhaps even, to begin to be a storyteller for not just yourself, but others as well. And sort of the importance of each of us really rallying at this time in our story. Not the story we make up in our head, not the negative story, not the like life sucks story, but the story of our lives and the beauty of our impact in the world when we share that story. Absolutely. So yes, I think one of the reasons why Anne Frank's story is so powerful and so relatable to teenagers is because everyone at that age is in a sort of hiding. We are terrified to be ourselves. We are terrified to show the world who we really are because social penalties at that age are everything. And, they're, and, and it's so looming and so huge. And I, uh, you probably don't know this about me, Willow, but when I was in junior high school, I went through this kind of crucible <laughs> of, of social pariahism because I, uh, I'm about to get super like out there here, guys. Ready? Do it. Get all out. So my first real boyfriend uh, caught me masturbating to girl on girl porn. And he told everybody. And so I suddenly was like the queer girl and the freak and like the one who, uh, you know, I don't know, can't get a boyfriend so bangs or something. Like they twisted it into this very bizarre thing, right? Whereas I was like, yeah, right. Like you guys don't jerk off. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, please. Yeah. Right. And so I had two options. I could go into hiding, which I kind of did for a while. I like stayed at home for a couple of days and just like had a nervous breakdown and like my bed was like shake because I was just like shaking all the time. And then I was like, fuck this. Like these assholes are not going to get the better of me. And so I wrote down on a like a notebook just like a, a hundred comebacks a hundred comebacks. And I had this notebook with me at all times. And so when someone would toss something at me, I would just boom, right back at them with a comeback. And, uh, and I became funny. And I didn't realize I was funny until mm -hmm. that moment, until I had to be funny. What was the <laughs> foresight on the hundred comebacks? I just didn't want to be unprepared for like people had been throwing stuff at me. People had been you know, just saying snarky comments to me in the hallway, writing Lesbo on my locker, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to uh, have, have a little prepared something or other to say mm -hmm. in advance so that mm -hmm. I wasn't thrown off by these mm -hmm. comments. Yeah. And, you know, this guy was like, hey, it's the girl who bangs herself. And I said, well, can you blame me? Look around. Don't have very much, uh, many, many other options around here. <laughs> And people started laughing and people started thinking that that was fun and that I like, I was kind of cool in this weird 
messed up way. Mm -hmm. And secretly, not in public, because then that would have made them like pariah, you know, by proxy. Right. But secretly, people started coming to me and treating me like the sort of Dr. Ruth of the junior high school of like, I'm attracted to this or that, or I find this interesting, or, you know, and just telling, confessing to me. Well, because it's so taboo at that age, yeah. we're in, all of us are sort of in our experimental phases, but nobody's talking about what's happening in our bodies and our minds and our spirits, our attractions or not attractions. It's like this super secret. And, and, and to be, to be fair, there are some families who are forward and open-minded about these topics and some yeah. families who are very shut down and yeah. don't speak of these topics. I came from a family that was like, my mom gave me a book, I think when I was 13 on masturbation. And so masturbation was like a topic of conversation at the Brandner household too. <laughs> Yeah. I was very clear that this was how I was going to get through without getting pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Not a girl. Whereas in my household, like I was living with my father who does not talk about personal stuff ever at all. But, you know, obviously had a, had a, a stack of Playboy and Penthouse magazines that I found, right? right. So there's something going on here. Right. And, <laughs> and so it was one of these things where like, I, I, I think he actually told my sister to come and talk to me about birth control. I think I, like, that's how I had the talk was like, my sister was like, Hey, dad will pay for your birth control if you want. Like yeah. that was the talk that right. I got. Right. And so I had to educate myself <laughs> on a lot of this stuff. And so then other people, like I said, started coming to me and I felt like I had this kind of weird responsibility to be the keeper of their secrets and to be the, the kind of listener and also to give them, you know, good advice. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you've ever seen the show Sex Education, like I can super relate to the, to the, to the, <laughs> the main character of this show. Yeah. But anyway, none of that has anything to do with Anne Frank. Uh, <laughs> let's let, we digress. Let's go to story. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but this is a story and it's a great one. So yes. there we go. See, so, this is what happens when you tell a story. Exactly. Gets involved. Exactly. <laughs> um, but the point is everyone was kind of in hiding around me, I felt like at that time in my life. And so I felt a responsibility, not just like to the role of uh, Anne, but to a lot of the people around me to kind of help us all start to tell our stories and come out of these closets that we mm -hmm. were living in. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever listened to my podcast, I have an episode um, where Please I tell the listeners about your podcast quick. So, so my podcast <laughs> is called That's Allowed. And the basic uh, premise is that I help people tell the stories that they were told not to talk about or that they're just not telling. And, and I love the double entendre. It yeah. only took me a year to figure out the double entendre, by the way, but it's just coming. It's not just allowed, you guys. It's allowed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to me, it's like the two sides of that inner dialogue that you have whenever you, like, you get this impulse to say something, to speak mm -hmm. your truth. Like I just did about, you know, yeah. masturbating in junior high school, right? <laughs> and you have this little voice in your head that's like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's allowed. We can all hear you. Right. You, you know what you sound like right now. And then there's this other voice that's like, no, that's allowed. Talk about it. Other yeah. people might find comfort in that. Other people might relate and go, oh my God, the same thing happened to me in high school or right. whatever it is. Right. So that's why it's called That's Allowed, A-L-O-U-D. And I have one episode where I talk about Anne Frank, and I don't want to give away the kind of twist surprise ending, but I will tell you that it playing that role taught me a lot more about myself than I ever knew was going to happen or expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, she really inspired me to start exploring, you know, I guess in a kind of navel gazing way, but also just exploring my own stories and how other people maybe could relate to them mm -hmm. and start living out loud in that way of, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's talk about this stuff. Why, mm -hmm. why aren't we talking about this? Well, and something that, that I, I mean, I've experienced you from a virtual, um, from a virtual relationship now for the last what, seven years since we had our children. Yeah. So it's been like seven, eight years since I've, I've like reclaimed you as a friend, but yeah. it's been over virtual. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm both impressed and also very scared about always <laughs> <laughs> is that you definitely push boundaries. Mm -hmm. 
And they're not always boundaries I'm comfortable with. I am a fucking vanilla when it comes to some of the information and intel that sometimes you scrape around. And I step in a landmine regularly for the boundaries that you push because I don't understand and I don't have a lot of the information. But I noticed that you do it better than most in that, and I'm saying this very clearly because I feel like some boundary pushers are pushing it so hard that there's not room for people to get it wrong. Yeah. There's not room for education. It's like, fuck you if you don't know, go get educated. I'm not here to help you. Yeah. Whereas with you, I see that you're opening the boundaries up. You're letting people know, like, here are some of the areas we need to improve peeps. And I want you to feel free to tell your story. And I want you to feel free to be scared. And I want you to feel free to be ignorant if that's where you need to be right, right. now. <laughs> and I'm here to hold you in that space and also offer you the opportunity to educate in this vacuum and in this space. That's what I think that you do best at this time is like, we are all coming from a place of story and we are all coming from a place of understanding, which is whatever bubble we've been living in, whatever rock we've been living under. And trust me, I live in very white rural Colorado, wherein my language is again, vanilla as fuck. So <laughs> she says, as fuck. Have, as fuck. yeah, but I mean, I got the swear words down, but I don't have the appropriate languaging for a lot of the things. And so one of the things that I've, again, I just want to say in terms of story is that again, you give rise to the uncomfortable. You give rise to the stories that a lot of people don't want to tell and a lot of people don't want to share, but you give a, a beautiful space to let people really unzip and become or and be simply themselves in that space. Again, whether or not people are ready always to hear it, it's a place for people to be that. Yeah. And I mean, I try to give a, an upfront explanation of what this story is going to be about so that people aren't like, you know, triggered or freaked out or, you know, I, I, the whole trigger warning thing. I have a big kind of like thing around because yeah, I think it's important to let people know what they're walking into so that they can sort of mentally prepare. But at the same time, I feel like if we're hiding from our triggers, then we're not growing. Mm -hmm. If we are, you know, shying away from those things that make us uncomfortable, then we're never going to get comfortable with those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. I feel like whenever I get scared of something or I find pain somewhere, that's a message for my soul telling me, go there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go there. That's what's going to help you grow next. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, again, I want to go into that trigger subject because um, let's just use uh, right now uh, on our Corona vacations here that we're in, um, a lot of people are going to be super triggered. And, and let's yeah. talk about sort of that story of why people get triggered. We get triggered because we don't feel seen or heard in that experience. And we get triggered because we don't feel that anybody's adequately paying attention to our issue. So if somebody's out at a bar and drinking with a group of people, an autoimmune person might be super fucking triggered by that because those people don't give a shit about what it seems like everybody else in the world. But then their story might be like, why am I to cocoon and have to stay indoors when I'm perfectly healthy? And it feels really obtuse for me to have to be under lock and key because somebody else might be sick. Whatever the story is, those are gonna be two trigger points. Let's just go into the obscene of just two obvious trigger points in a time like this. Sure. And. And I kind of want to speak to, to that degree of story because what can we do in, in storytelling? Yeah. Express that, yourself. Yeah. Express yourself. And, and how through story do we help? How do, that's a great question. How in story do we help promote our point of view without losing our audience? Great question. I love it. So the idea is whenever you have, whenever you experience something like that, a trigger, that's actually a, a, a way for your, you know, your, your mind to tell you, this is a story. This is a story that's worth telling. So if you have an experience that has a strong emotional reaction, 
that's a story. You just have a story now. So let's say you, you know, you, you see a group of people at a bar that look like they're having a great time and you get salty about it. And you're like, that sucks that people are, you know, doing this right now. But at the same time, you don't know their story. You don't know what's going on. Maybe, uh, you know, one of them is dying and this is their last hurrah. You know, you don't know what's going on with other people. You never really know. And, and we do all these predictions, right? But what you can do is tell that story from your perspective and recognize that like, this is what's happening with me right now. This is the experience that I'm having of this anecdote. And the way that you don't lose your audience, there's a couple of ways. First of all, be relatable. Just keep it to, you know, to the general, like you don't have to get into all the little details that don't matter to anybody else, right? It doesn't matter what flavor of gum you were chewing. Nobody cares what you were on your way to do. It's about that experience that we've all had of seeing something that we don't fully understand, but that upset us and that brought up some emotions in us. So keep to the relatable parts, basically. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is really try to bring your audience in by making, making those connections obvious. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to beat people over the head with your messaging, mm -hmm. but at the same time, help them understand why you're telling this story mm -hmm. for them. Make it explicit, like, I want everybody else to know that I'm having this experience right now and it's okay if you're having this experience right now or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So offer a permission slip. Definitely. And invite mm -hmm. people to share as well. One of the things that I always do, you know, in my podcast and when I write things is just invite people to comment and to uh, give their their perspective on whatever we're talking about because mm -hmm. everyone's got their own story and everybody's got their own perspective but you'd be amazed how many people can relate to mm -hmm. what feels like a very personal story to you because mm -hmm. like you said you know not everybody played Anne Frank in high school but maybe you you had something happen to you that really changed your perspective on your life at that time in your life and made you realize something about yourself. We've all had that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've noticed <clears throat> on uh, social media in particular right now that people are using it for a space to social journal. Yeah. Which I'm loving. Oh. I'm loving like <laughs> how people are sort of sharing in their experience of quarantine day three. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And you said something so profound earlier before we started recording, which was, it's not just noticing the shit, it's noticing the little things. So I'd love for you to speak about like little identifiers in your day or what add to the story or what add to sort of the experience that maybe, maybe you can throw our egos a bone to start looking for these things yeah. So that we're not focused on the, oh my God, I'm out of toilet paper. Or, oh my God, I don't want to get sick. Or, oh my God, fear. What are some bones that you can throw our ego to look for so that we can start creating better stories? Great. So I'm going to give you three. Okay. So the first one is something that I started doing recently. Oh my God, I'm touching my face too much. <laughs> no. Like, ah! <laughs> yeah, <it's going laughs> my we're home. So we can yeah, no, watch okay. your it's okay. <laughs> I've touched all this stuff already. So the first thing is something that I've started doing recently, which is what I call a uh, hundred days of delight. Mm -hmm. And every day I look for some small thing that delights me and I take mm -hmm. a picture of it and I put it on Instagram. It's a simple, silly little thing, but you'd be amazed how just having that focus mm -hmm. all day long of like, what's delightful, scanning for the delightful, you will find it everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you go on a walk and you find 20 delightful things. Yes. Or you're sitting in your living room and you're like, that's delightful. This is delightful. You're delightful. I'm delightful. Everything's delightful. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing that you can do is just challenge yourself to find something that brings you joy or makes you smile mm -hmm. every freaking day. Yeah. Second thing. Um, I started a thing. <laughs> I've been starting a lot of things lately. So the other thing I started today was um, I'm calling it Project Sanitation. I saw that. And what I'm doing is I'm just launching a silly fun challenge to my friends to try to get them to be a little more playful during their enforced staycation. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is just to put on a song that brings you joy and sing along to it or dance along to it or just, you know, enjoy the heck out of it and record yourself doing that and, mm -hmm. and to post it. Uh, and, and there will be more coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great way. Another thing to do is uh, I call this uh, Thankful Thursdays, which I just send out thank you notes. Which I got from you. Thank yes, you. Yes, <laughs> because you're wonderful and I thank you. Um, but just having that impetus to write to people, you know, it feels weird sometimes to just reach out and be like, hey, what's up? Still in quarantine? Me too. But if you have now a reason that you're writing, ever, we need to do that too. Exactly. Yeah. With gratitude. You know, yeah. if you're approaching someone with like, hey, I appreciate something about you. Like that starts a real profound connection conversation mm -hmm. where people really feel seen and they really feel understood. And that in turn makes them turn around and think about what do I see in this person? What do I, you know, and, and so then you can get that experience of really feeling seen and appreciated in return. Right. So um, what I loved about number one, which mm -hmm. is the delightful aspect in, in my training in manifesting, Mm -hmm. What I think is really interesting is there's a neurological um, expedition, again, that your ego goes on when you make a decision that you are going to look for something, say, delightful and or $1 million, because I like the spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> that would be delightful. Right? I would love a $1 million. And I say this every day. I am, I am on a mission for $1 million. Um, what your brain actually does beyond like, trying to prove you wrong, what your brain does is it becomes a partner in manifesting. It becomes yeah. a partner in manifesting. So it's not just spiritually speaking, but as well, like scientifically speaking, your brain is on the mission too. And I kind of call it like the Easter egg hunt because it's like, we're looking for Easter eggs and our brain is now on the mission to create and generate something that it has to look for. So it's yeah. no longer looking for the bad news. It's looking for the delightful news. Yeah. In my case, I'm looking for a backpack or a wallet or <laughs> something. Yeah with cash. I want it easy, and fun, <laughs> fucking clear. But if I'm on a hike, you can guarantee I'm looking for a wallet. So okay. <laughs> I'm looking for a lottery ticket. <laughs> and it's hilarious. And it's truly like the thing I do because it's funny. Because yeah, um, one of these days it's going to happen. It's going to happen, you guys. <laughs> I'm going to be the girl who finds a million dollars. I have it in my mind. Um, but I love that from the perspective of just manifesting. And I believe that gratitude is the, is the first step in manifesting everything that you want. Oftentimes we're manifesting from a place of lack or doubt or yeah. fear versus a, a, a space of true gratitude. So just the exercise of looking for delight anyways, with or without a pandemic is a really great practice regardless of everything else. Um, and then just reaching out to people right now in general with gratitude, I think it does both things. And you, and you touched on that. And that is every single one of us wants to be seen. And yeah. every single one of us wants to be recognized sort of for whatever variation of greatness is that, that's inside of us or for whatever variation of us that feels uh, a, a need for that light. Yeah. It's when we actually start looking at it in others and rewarding them with gratitude that it does, again, come full circle back. As we're sitting at home with our partners, our loved ones, our children, whoever's around, even our animals, what tends to get noticed is what we don't have. Again, we move into that very scary lack position of they're not doing what I need from them right now. Mm -hmm. But if we're a mirror to our people for what we're actually looking for, if we become the hero or shiro that we are looking for, it will come back to us tenfold. So I want to yeah. offer that as just an amplification. Yes, please. Can I jump on that? Please. One of the beautiful things about storytelling is that you become the hero of your own story. And by narrating your life in that way and shaping your experiences in that way, you can actually change the past and the future mm -hmm. by making yourself into this hero where that thing that happened to you happened for you. Yeah. That experience that you had was actually for your growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And when you can frame things in that way, it becomes incredibly powerful. Yeah. And so when you look at these stories, the reason I, I help people tell the stories they're not telling is that often those stories, they're not telling them because it feels like, you know, it's a, a, it's a shame story or it's a confession or it's just they, they don't think people want to hear that or, you know, whatever it is. And when you actually start to tell that story, you realize how it changed you. You realize how it made you stronger. You realize how you can use this story to actually help people through pain that they're experiencing right now. It's interesting because what you're talking about is the evolution from victim to responsibility. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I personally, like in the psychic experience, don't really work with anybody who's before responsibility. Yeah. I work with people once they've owned that story. And I think we all have stories wherein the victimhood is still ringing quite loudly in our brains. Yeah. What I think is really interesting is my spiritual teacher said, when she hears people tell that story over and over and over again, and we do, we get on a loop sometimes of our negativity <laughs> or of our victim story. Mm -hmm. She says, actually, write that story down. Yes. And then tell it to yourself 50 times. Mm. Read it 50 times the way that you're telling every fucking body this negative story. And then when you feel pretty fucking done with that and you're so bored and you don't want to hear it anymore, <laughs> rewrite it. Right. To That's where you're brilliant. the hero of the story. Well, because I it's like, I just don't think we hear ourselves sometimes. No, I don't I think that we hear how um, victimized we are. <laughs> And also, I think when you, when you have that story looping in your head and it's filtering your world through it, you're mm -hmm. not aware of it. When you tell that story and make it into a story, now you control it as a story mm -hmm. and it's outside of yourself. So it's not in there messing things up anymore. Mm -hmm. It's outside yeah. of you and it's yeah. a story that you can do something with. Right. And so that's why I always recommend to people, if there's something that just keeps going through your head, say it out loud, write it down, put it outside of yourself somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have a group called uh, Living Out Loud. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I give little prompts to help people just get stuff outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we do every day. We do mm -hmm. these little exercises where we just get our stories out of ourselves. Yeah. And it's kind of a, an experiment in like live journaling as a as a community, which is cool. Um, but it's also just a, a discipline and a practice yeah. for yourself of, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of writers, they do morning pages. When mm -hmm. you wake up, the first thing you do is just like get all the crap that's in your head out onto paper. And it's not necessarily something that you're going to use. It's like skimming this, the crap off the top so you can get to what's really going on and you can find the good stuff. Morning pages are my favorite for anybody who's made it this far in our conversation because <laughs> there is always an aha. And I always say ahas are yes. like orgasms, like aha. Oh. <laughs> I love it. And if you're lucky, you'll get multiples every day. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. One so often leads to many. Morning pages <laughs> you gotta always. Gotta start with one. Or you're not gonna get <laughs> Uh, yeah, morning pages always brings me the ahas for sure. Um, yeah, I do. I do love the the group journaling process because again, you have that accountability aspect of it. So, um, what I would love is um, Adrienne's going to leave us her links, so that'll be in the email below. So please, if you want to check out her Facebook page and get in her group, so that you can start journaling your story and start finding a really lovely way to represent yourself in this time period, because who knows if you're going to be loving the time of coronavirus or not with your own story. Right. And who knows what brilliance is going to come out of this experience. Like Absolutely. I think we're, we're dimming ourselves or dumbing ourselves down to think that, that we're somehow, um, victims even in this wherein we've been really in a lot of cases offered an opportunity and i understand the financial stresses and pressures that come with this i understand the fear that 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 loss i, I really feel that loss is the fear that everybody's really working through right now is just sure. what it feels like to maybe not have enough money or not have a gig or not have something that, that unknown that is fucking a boil on our ass right now. But the truth is, is what is in our control 
is every day, is our present moment in that moment. And when you're writing about it and when you're, when you're not paralyzed in it, but you're participating in it and you have a group that can guide you through those words and those emotions and those feelings, yeah. it's just going to benefit you all so much and each of us because when we see the light in you then then you're able to see the light in us and yeah. as a collective togetherness experiment which this fucking project really is here <laughs> we've gotta we've gotta rise through this you know vacation that we've all been given without warning and yeah. see what we can do with it and see what we can make of it so, so let me let me add one thing about yes, that fear yes. of loss yeah. So whenever you feel fear of loss, what that is, is it's a reminder to appreciate what you have while you have it. Mm -hmm. So every time you get scared, like, oh, my, you know, my kids uh, might get sick, um, go spend some time with your kids. When you think, oh, my, you know, my elderly loved ones might not make it through this, go call them right now spend some quality time with them. Like make sure that you are paying attention to that message because that message is important. It's telling you this matters to you. You mm -hmm. care about this and that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I've emailed each of you prior, um, I started a food drive. Yeah. I just decided, I was like, what can I do right now that's actually going to be of service in a real physical way? Like yeah. happy to, happy to do videos, happy to get together with friends, happy to inspire, happy to do all of that. But what physically can I do for people who are going to be hurting because of the financial impacts are something that I actually literally physically and intuitively and psychically feel in so many different ways right now. It's one of yeah. my primary triggers. It's something I'm always working on is abundance. Um, so to feel abundant mm -hmm. is to donate and to Absolutely. feel a part of the thing I'm most afraid of was to create abundance for other people in the arena of having enough food yes. and knowing that I was able to provide that in whatever capacity. I bought a ton of extras as well. I collected a ton of extras so that I could give back to my community so that we had enough when ever supplies got low that I could be a pantry for other humans. And yeah. so those are the little things, but that was a story. You know, I, I have a story about not enough money and I'm sure that's many of yours. So how can we collectively again, work through that trigger story, right? That yeah. Audrian was speaking to us about and create a better opportunity for the world around us. Yeah. And, and tell those stories, get those stories out there. If you have a story that you want to share because you're not sharing it right now, or you think it's important right now, let me know. I would love to have you on my podcast and give you a, a bigger platform for your voice. Yay. I love yeah. it. So good. Anything else? Any other last words of wisdom? Go tell your stories. There has never been a better time than right now. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect opportunity to slow down, look back on your life, look back on your experiences and say, what is the story that somebody else needs to hear mm -hmm. and who needs to hear it and mm -hmm. get it out there. If you need help, I'm here for you. Yeah. And as well, what story do you need to break up with? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And sometimes that is the story that you need to yeah. tell just to break up with it. Yeah. Just to absolutely. get it out outside of you and go, this does not need to be my story anymore. 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 That's absolutely. Mm -hmm. So cool. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll have all of Adrian's links and abilities to work with her and get to know her and listen to her podcast and all of the delight that she brings into the world so that you guys have more to do on your coronation. Lots of love, <laughs> right. you guys. Peace in. Bye.